A pie storm is coming, hello cave dwellers. It's 2021 and who would have believed that the market for upgrades and accelerators for a 30 year old plus computer would be as hotly contested as it is now. And this, the Pi Storm, is just the latest addition to a range of options available to Amiga owners, but also the owners of any machine with a 68,000 CPU, because this does aim to cater to all of them further down the line. However, it's using the Amiga market to get its leg up, which means it's in competition with the likes of the Terrible Fire, the Vampire, the Buffy, which is in development. I'm interested to see how that comes along and things like the ACA 500 plus. Loads and loads of options out there. But the difference with this is that this board cost me under 15 pounds. It's a hat that sits on a Raspberry Pi, as the name implies. It's all based around a Raspberry Pi, currently supporting the Raspberry Pi 3. In fact, the 3A Plus is the one that you want to go on here. And uh, that means overall, once you've added the cost of the Pi, it costs less than 50 pounds, way cheaper than the three digit price of many of the other options out there. It promises to compete with those other options and also traditional upgrades like those on the table here. Bringing you a faster CPU for your machine, it can be configured as a Motorola 68020, 030, 040 and beyond. And this is achieved through software emulation running on the Pi, which means while it supports the Pi 3 at the moment, if the intended support for the Pi 4 comes to fruition, your next Amiga upgrade could just be a case of swapping out the Pi and suddenly you've got an even faster Amiga again. It also offers 128 meg of RAM and a hard drive in the form of a virtual hard drive on which you can mount a file that you've set up in WinUAE and copied over to the Pi which you may well do by Wi-Fi because of course the Raspberry Pi has a Wi-Fi network card so you can get it on the network and then you can copy your hard drive file across and you can SSH into it to configure it from your PC without ever having to open up the Amiga, which is really useful. It also promises RTG or retargetable graphics so you can get higher resolutions and more colors in your productivity applications and in Workbench. And there's a lot more in the pipeline as we'll discuss today. Lots of things hidden away in config files which haven't yet been enabled but obviously the intent is there to get it working. I couldn't wait to see how this thing performed, but first of all, I had to solder it up. And so we'll use the process of soldering it just to get to know the board a little bit better and any problems that I ran into along the way of getting it up and running. Let's take a look. RMC is supported by MonsterJoysticks.com. Level up your retro gaming with their joysticks featuring genuine Sanwar arcade parts and oneclickprint.com for your photos on canvas, acrylic, gifts and more. Local craftsmen and global delivery. The PyStorm kit arrived nearly complete with the key components pre-soldered including the Ultera Max 2 CPLD or Complex Programmable Logic Device. This is a chip with non-volatile memory in it so it can be configured to communicate with the Amiga and will be flashing it to do just that and it will then retain those settings once powered off. It is however in short supply like so many other components right now so the waiting list for the PyStorm is fairly long. Mine is a revision B board so this has been through at least one revision before making it out into the wild and all I should need to do is solder on the header to attach it to the Raspberry Pi and the legs for the CPU socket. So I gave the board a clean with some IPA and I prepared the pads with some flux before commencing soldering. The design of the board includes no thermal relief, so the ground plane is very keen to sink away the iron's heat, and I made doubly sure to anchor on those ground pins. You'll also notice the CPU socket pads are really quite small, and a little more pad would have been appreciated if possible, especially if you find yourself having to remove and replace those legs if one gets damaged for example. But on the whole it was a pretty trivial task to get this soldered up, or so I thought because the included rows of pin headers, which I'm soldering on for the CPU socket, well, they're gonna cause me some serious pain soon. But at this point, I was blissfully unaware. Yeah. 
The Pi Storm is designed for the Raspberry Pi 3A Plus, but is compatible with the 3B Plus if you use a relocator or remove the USB ports because there isn't enough clearance for them and the profile of the whole thing has to be kept low if it's to fit inside the most common of Amigas, the 500 model. This is actually a 3B and not a Plus, which has a slower CPU than the Plus, so you want to stick to the Pluses, but just to show it's possible, let's whip off those USB ports. And there you can see it fits quite happily. If we see the quicker Raspberry Pi 4 supported further down the line by the Pi Storm, then this might be a step that you need to take. Today though, we will be using the 3A Plus. The final thing to do before we can put the Pi into the Amiga is to make sure that we have it on the Wi-Fi and can remotely access it. I'm just preparing an SD card here using another Pi. What can I say? I have far too many of them here in the cave. And this video is not a tutorial in setting up the Pi Storm, although we will look at some of the settings because I highly suspect the setup process will change a lot in the coming months as the whole thing is streamlined. I would hope that there will eventually be an SD card image to download and just write to get you up and running. But for now, you have to write the OS Raspbian Lite to the SD card and then make sure that you're connected to the Wi-Fi and SSH is enabled so that you can remote into it. I'm using PuTTY to bring up a remote console over SSH. Then the remaining configuration can happen once the Pi is in an Amiga. And that raises the big question for me, what Amiga shall I put this in? Hmm, decisions, decisions. Do we go with an almost new looking A500? A machine that never fails to stop me in my tracks for a look when I'm walking past it. Well, we could, but it'd be a shame to put such a modern upgrade in such a lovely example of a stock machine. Or should we make it clear that this Amiga is a bit different? Now that will do nicely. There'll be no confusing this for a stock Amiga. I give you the Amiga Snotstorm 500. Now, I told you this was a very early days for this project, a version 1.0 if you like, and in the time it's taken me to introduce it to you and to come over here to set it up, I've got word that the creator Claude Schwartz has got this working now with a Pi Zero and is working on getting it going with a Pi version 4. By the time this video comes out, it will probably will be working on those Pis. So just, this is such a fast moving thing. But let's get our first impressions. Let's get this installed. And that's far easier said than done because my first attempt at installation saw the Pi Storm constantly popping out of the CPU socket. I just couldn't get it to stay in no matter what I tried. And I didn't want to risk damaging it or the Amiga. So what I had to do was swap out the legs for longer ones on the Pi Storm, which was no easy task as I alluded to earlier, thanks to those tiny pads. As a result though, it was much happier in the socket. Nice and tight in there, that's not popping out. And uh, do double check yours before you solder them up if you're uh, following suit. If you're a stickler for original parts in your Amiga, then you won't get the shielding back on with this installed, but most have removed that anyway, so it's, it's no big deal. And just to be safe, you probably want to make sure the rear of your keyboard isn't going to short out the Pi. So if you haven't got your original back in, you'll want to put something on in its place. And as a fun extra test, I'm leaving a two meg RAM expansion installed. This is a model from boobip.com. And I'm hoping that the Pi Storm will play nicely with any existing upgrades. So we'll leave it in there to put it to the test. Right, I've now had a chance to play with it and get to know it a little better. It's been quite a roller coaster. There have been highs and lows, and yes, keep in mind it's an open source project with a lot of very clever people working on it and very early days, as I keep saying. But here are my first impressions, starting from configuring it. This is not a tutorial, remember, but I'll just take you through some of the configuration and what we can do with it. So we turn the Amiga on, and the Amiga won't do anything until the emulator started on the Pi. In order to do that, you can either set up the emulator to run as a service, so it will start automatically as soon as the Pi is booted, or you can SSH into the Pi and manually start it, which is what I'll do now. And here's the bit I love. At the press of a button, the Amiga will boot and I have complete control of it from my laptop 
wirelessly. I feel like hacker man over here. And I can edit the config and I can make it do exactly what I want. At this stage, it's just booting into the Kickstart ROM that's in there, Kickstart 1.3. If we take a closer look, you'll find that everything to do with this is in a single config file called default.cfg. By default, it's configured as a 68020 CPU with 128 meg of RAM, and I've disabled pretty much everything else, including the Kickstart ROM option, so it uses that internal Kickstart 1.3. And here I am starting the emulator again from a screen capture, my laptop on the left and the Amiga on the right. As the Amiga comes to life, every part of it is alive and working. It just has an emulated, a software emulated CPU and that RAM, but all of the custom chips, everything else about the Amiga is working. And now we can really begin to have some fun. If you want to upgrade your Amiga with a different kickstart, all you have to do is jump into the config file, point it to your kickstart ROMs, in this case I've selected 3.1, and then restart the emulator. And now, there it is, it boots into 3.1. Go back into the config, change it again, reboot, and it's 2.0. It's great to be able to do that so easily. And likewise, to be able to just change the CPU to a 68030 or an 040, just in that config file. And just by upping it to an 030 or an 040 doesn't mean you're getting a faster CPU, it just means you're getting the extra instructions that come with those. You may need to chop and change them according to any compatibility problems you come across and um, any speed issues that we'll talk about shortly because I do come across some. But before we get to that, my favorite feature of all on the Pi Storm is this. I can enable a virtual hard drive, I point it to an HDF file so you can create that in WinUAE. And when I reboot the Amiga now, it boots straight up into that hard disk image. I can have multiple hard disk images, I can have multiple config files, and I can chop and change my Amiga's configuration really quickly and easily. It's, it's incredibly powerful to be able to do that. So let's check the performance of this then by first comparing it against a stock A500 with SysInfo. The stock machine gives us 550 dry stones under a speed test, which is as expected. Over to the Pi Storm now, and my first test was performed using the Pi Storm with only the CPU emulator enabled, and, well, it's quite disappointing. It's slower even than stock with the 68020 CPU enabled. But alas, that was quickly rectified by switching to the Kickstart 3.1 ROM and testing again. And now we have 14,485 dry stones. That's a big improvement, taking this to well above the stock Omega 3000, Closer to a 68040 Amiga 4000, which is not bad at all. We can also see the 128 meg of RAM is detected in sysinfo and, crucially, the BooBip RAM expansion checks out too, so we've got no problems working with existing trapdoor upgrades. But the biggest surprise for me was when we checked out the hard disk speed. This is quite incredible. I enabled our virtual hard disks and ran the speed test again, and when I tested them, sysinfo reports a speed of around 750 megabytes per second. Now to put that in some kind of context, let's run the same test on a Vampire V4 standalone. It really comes as no surprise that the Vampire is reporting a tenfold CPU speed increase over the Pi Storm. It is a 350 euro product after all, and it prides itself on its FPGA based CPU speed. But when we check the hard drive speeds, the Pi Storm absolutely thrashes the Vampire. The Vampire clock in a little over 10 megabytes per second, while the Pi Storm is reporting that 750 megabytes. And this doesn't appear to be a sysinfo anomaly as far as I can tell, because if I reboot the machine now, I'll do a soft reset with the control Amiga Amiga keys, and it takes about three seconds from reset to workbench loading up fully. I've never seen an Amiga boot into Workbench this quickly. It's really quite mind-bending. So how does this all translate into some gaming tests? I'm sure you're keen to find out. I know I was, so let's try some out. We'll start with the mandatory Frontier test, struggling along here on a stock A500. I can't believe I played and enjoyed this at this speed back in the day. But there it is, chugging along on the stock A500. And now here it is on the Pi Storm, as smooth as butter. A side-by-side -side comparison now, just in case you're in any doubt, and uh, I think that's a big green tick for the Pi Storm.
It's not all plain sailing though, take Damocles for example. The Pi Storm is the large window in the middle of the screen, the top right is the A500 stock and the bottom right is the Vampire. The Pi Storm here is running in 68030 mode and it not only falls behind the stock A500 in the intro sequence, at times it seems to have a lower frame rate. The Vampire of course has charged ahead making short work of this, but the Pi Storm just falls further and further behind and it just doesn't feel right. To investigate a little further, I took the Pi Storm's config back to a 68020 CPU and ran it again. For comparison, it's running it as a 68030 on the left and a 68020 on the right, and the 68020 is returning a better performance. Now, I couldn't tell you why. I don't know if the Pi is being pushed too hard in 030 mode or if the software isn't optimized. I can only tell you that these are my findings and um, who knows, maybe the Pi 4 would give better returns when that's supported. Another game now that I found in testing which gave me a chuckle, this is Hunter. Now Hunter on the Pi Storm doesn't seem to give a noticeable speed increase over stock, but it does get something right. It appears that this demo is playing back a sequence of recorded key presses and any problems with timing will result in things being pressed at the wrong time. The vampire falls foul first by smashing the car into a tank and it gets kind of stuck there. The Pi Storm, however, replays the demo perfectly, flying a helicopter and taking out missile launchers. The issue we saw with Damocles running faster as an O20 than an O30 wasn't isolated, it turned out. As my testing continued, I found in Stunt Car Racer, here on the O20 running on the left, it has a higher frame rate than the O30 mode on the right. Once again, I can't really explain what's happening under the hood, but I think they're interesting tests and perhaps we should come back to them in a few months time as the project matures. So we're getting a feel for the Pi Storm now, but there was one more test that I wanted to do prompted by a question that I put to John Romero on behalf of a viewer recently. Well, here's what he had to say. Um, next question, Matthew. John, do you regret saying that the Amiga was incapable of running Doom? Well, it was. I'm not, <laughs> <laughs> obviously. Um, that's, uh, read, if you read uh, Amiga history books, the history books say that the death of the Amiga, they're going to just kind of blame Doom for because everybody left to play Doom. Well, yes, with the help of the Pi Storm, you can run Doom on an Amiga 500 to a playable but not astonishingly playable level. Has John Romero been proven wrong by the Pi Storm? Well, yes, I guess, but I checked my calendar and it's not 1993 anymore, so um, I don't think it will hold much weight if I call him back. d games of course are a great way to stress test a cpu to see if games stay in sync once they're accelerated with other events within the game like damocles you have the little messages coming across the bottom of the screen and they got all out of sync with the actual events happening in the screen not just with the pi storm but with the vampire and other accelerators as well and it's always interesting to compare accelerators to that brute force of the vampire but let's be honest, us gamers, most of the games we play on an Amiga are 2D games. We don't dip into that many 3D games on the whole. And I think it was in the CDTV series recently when I said, all I really want from an Amiga is convenience. I want a hard drive. I want a bit of extra RAM to cope with WHD load. And I want a bit of extra CPU power. 14 or 20 megahertz is more than enough to give me that authentic Amiga experience that I remember, albeit with rose tinted spectacles on, with a bit more convenience on top. And that's what the Pi Storm delivers, and development continues at a pace. I've now downloaded an updated version of the emulator that allows the Amiga to communicate directly with the Raspberry Pi, so it can be reset, shut down, or reconfigured using 
a native Amiga program running within Workbench. How cool is that? And I haven't even touched on RTG and what we can do on that to get the improved graphics out of the HDMI port. But being a gamer, that doesn't affect me massively because even if you have that working, the old games are still going to come out of the RGB port at the back. However, even that is being developed. The PyStorm team are working on a way to get the RGB signals out of the video chip, Denise, feed them into the webcam port on top of the um, Pi, and then merge that with the RTG and send it all out of the HDMI port. And even though I have a CRT, that's still good for me because I could 3D print a little bracket on the side to have the HDMI out, feed it through to there, maybe an SD card extender there, so we've got them both accessible on the side. And then I could put an HDMI to VGA dongle into the HDMI port, which has now got the RGB graphics as well, remember, and feed that into any 31 kilohertz CRT monitor. So I'm not restricted to the very few 15 kilohertz monitors are available, as lovely as this is. And I can combine the RTG. I don't need a, a multi-sync monitor. I can get everything through a CRT. So it's effectively a free scan doubler built in. It's incredible what they're doing with this Pi Storm. It really is a project that keeps on giving. And I'm going to set a date in my diary for six months time so we can come back and revisit this and just see how well it's matured and what extra features there are for us. If you're interested in getting one, I highly recommend you join their Discord server. The link is in the video description. There are some problems at the moment globally getting hold of components, especially the CPLD chip. So don't begrudge them if they can't get it out to you as quickly as possible, but just go onto their server and join the group buy room and you can get yourself on the waiting list and get hold of one. I'll see us out now with lots more footage of games running on the Pi Storm. In my opinion, it's a great balance of price, performance, practicality, and I think it really will turn some of the competitors green with envy. Thanks for watching. Take care.